Hello. 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 OK, thanks. Um, so I'm from a little town called New York City. And uh, I work at Bloomberg, and we're going to talk about variants today. So before we get started, just to get an idea, how many of you guys uh, use variants? About half, maybe three quarters of you. How many of you guys don't know if you use variants or not? OK, a few. All right, well, we're at least going to clear that up. And the answer is probably that you don't use variants. Um, so this is about the past, present, and future, about this nice data structure here. Um, so in 2004, Boost variant was released in Boost 1.31.0. And uh, that should tell you that we've had a lot of experience with this thing. Uh, in 2016, uh, variant was voted into C++17, 2016 being this year, for those of you who don't realize that. Um, that just happened recently, and it was a very awesome thing to get into the standard, and it took a lot of work to get, get it there. And sometime in the future, maybe there's going to be uh, language-based variant support in the next, some next revision, and I'll just touch on that at the end of what we're going to talk about. So first off, motivating examples. Who cares about variant? Why do we need it? Um, you're going to see, you've seen code like this before. So basically what you have is you have a person ID. A person ID can either be a name of the person or maybe a John Doe number. And uh, it's never both. You either have a name for the person or he's got a John Doe ID. And it's done like this. So you have your getters up there. Um, you have some Boolean which says which of these things is actually active at the right point. And then you have your string for the name and your int for the John Doe ID. So far, so good, right? Um, you need to document your undefined behavior, though, because if this person ID happens to be a uh, John Doe, then you shouldn't be calling the get name function. So you might document your undefined behavior with something like behavior is undefined unless has name equals true. So you got to add that to your interface. OK. This happens a lot. It's in a lot of different kinds of code. And it should be completely replaced by a variant. And we'll see how later. Um, the problems with this approach, we don't get any compiler help for checking those preconditions. Like There are no guarantees that our users using this code are actually going to make sure that the preconditions are met, uh, not at compile time anyway. Uh, there's wasted space, because you have the string and you have the int, where you really only need one of those at a time. So you just got this wasted space. And there's just a bunch of boilerplate, which is error prone. So um, these are drawbacks with this approach. Here's another example. Um, sometimes you'll see this kind of thing. So what you have is an abstract base class. So this we have like a command, like maybe some kind of commands in a game or something like that. Um, you have some kind of virtual function, this, in this case called put, which is just outputting a, something useful to the stream that's put in there and a virtual destructor. And then each of your commands are going to inherit from this abstract base class and specialize the put function. And you know this has a double the set score function in this example. So that's what that's all about. Um, the problems with this is if you're using an abstract base class to model this, you're going to have uh, allocation and memory management to worry about. So it just adds another level of complexity to your API. Are you going to have to use shared pointer, unique pointer? What kind of questions, those kinds of questions you have to answer. Um, every single operation that you want that works on all of the different things, which are commands, needs to have a virtual uh, function in the base class. So uh, that can kind of be annoying. So I say functions are split here. And what I mean by that is you really think of this put function as one function. But it's split the implementation is split between a whole bunch of different files, usually translation units, uh, because of uh, it needs to be implemented in each particular thing that inherits from it. And uh, there's just lots of boilerplate here. And uh, finally, this is open instead of closed. Because if I give an interface, uh, if I provide an API which has this command abstract base class, then my clients can inherit from it and add commands. Sometimes you want this, sometimes you don't. Uh, like in this kind of case, I don't want them to add their own commands. My, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense for my game. So uh, that can be undesirable. So people get around some of these issues. Um, you've probably seen this kind of pattern before. So you, so you have your abstract base class, and it has a type enum. 
And this thing just basically enumerates every single possible thing which inherits from this base class. Um, you have a get type function which will tell you which, uh, when you have an instance of it, you can tell you which uh, thing which inherits from it is currently in your object. And, uh, and then each of the things which inherit from this abstract base class, get type you return the corresponding enum for this. So if you want to use one of these things, you, you call get type, you figure out which type it is, you downcast to the right thing, and then you can write your functions that way. So uh, we still have allocation and memory management required for this. Uh, functions are no longer split. Like if I wanted to write a put function, I could write that in one spot. Uh, I don't need to add anything to the abstract base class. Uh, there's even more boilerplate now, and this time it's error prone. If you return the wrong thing from, set, from this get type function, you're going to get some kind of error uh, at runtime. And it's still open instead of closed, not exactly what we want. And the third example here is just a simple binary tree. Um, this one is recursive because if you have a branch, right, and, and you have the branch and the leaf both inherit from the, from the base class, the branch refers to the tree node at the top there. So it's a recursive thing. I'm not going to go into a lot of this particular example right now. Uh, we're going to get to it later, but just keep it in mind as this is another thing that you should be using variant for. So what is variant? The way I like to think about this is and versus or. If you got a struct and it has two uh, members in there, an X member and a Y member. It has an X member and a Y member. Key word there is and. If you have a variant with an X and a Y, it has an X or a Y. So it's either going to have an X or it's going to have a Y. It'll never have both. So it's and versus or. So going back to our person ID, which is either a name or a John Doe ID, um, the way that you put that into a variant is you say, okay, using person ID, this is really fancy C++11 stuff here. You could also use a type def. Uh, using person ID is equal to variant string int. So a person ID is either going to be a string or an int. It's as simple as that. So um, let's look at our command example. So we had again, our abstract base class and uh, our set score thing which inherits from it. The way you do this now is you figure out all the things that uh, are commands, like set score, give it the data member that it needs, in this case the double value, and then say using command equals variant, set score, fire missile, all the other kinds of things. So a command is either a set score or it's a fire missile or it's a fire laser or it's a rotate. Right? Simple enough. And here's just a slide that talks about the different names of variant, because you'll hear it come up under other names in different conversations. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but just so you know, some people call it the or type. Some people call it the sum type. If you hear conversations about the sum types, we're talking about variants. Um, discriminated union. Okay, this is like a mathematical term for it, and it has like the union sign with a little plus in the middle there. Um, they call this the algebraic data type pipe operator, or a one of type. These are just different names for the same thing. It'll come up every now and then. So we have variants, we have inheritance. When would you use one, when would you use the other? Um, well, just to look at some of the differences. A variant, or if you're using inheritance, it's open to new alternatives. Right? Someone can come along, look at your abstract base class, and add more things to it. A variant is closed. Once you have that using whatever equals variant, you can't expect some client to come in there and shove another type in there, right? It's, it's set when you provide it to them. Um, inheritance is closed to new operations, generally speaking. You only have that set list of virtual functions, where a variant doesn't have any of these functions defined when you declare your variant. You can always add new operations to a variant over all the different alternatives that it has. Um, inheritance, you have this multi-level thing. Variants are only single level, you just have that list of types. Inheritance is an object-oriented construct, uh, whereas variants are more a functional programming type thing. Uh, and you can take that as based on mathematical analysis that come up with these ideas. Um, inheritance is very complex. You think about public, private, protected, all this kind of stuff. 
Um, variants are very simple at their core. It's just this or this or this or this. So uh, boost variant has been around for a long time. Let's review their implementation of it. So we know we can create a variant. And uh, when you make a variant, the default, oh, Uh, the default constructor uh, just in initializes to the first alternative. So if the first alternative, like string, has a default constructor, which it does, then the variant is going to initialize to a string which is empty. All right, that's just the rule. Assignment, so I can say v equals three, and it says, okay, I'm assigning to an int, that means I need to switch to, now I'm holding an int, um, or v equals hello world in a string, then it'll realize that that needs to be a string, and it'll do the right thing. That's how you change the value of a variant. Extracting a value is a little bit more complicated. Um, in this case, we're going to write our output here. And you use this boost get thing. Uh, boost get takes a single template parameter, which is which type you want to pull out of it. Um, and it can take in a pointer to a variant. It will return null if it doesn't have that particular alternative active or it will return a pointer to the active thing. And then you can do stuff with it. Uh, boost get also takes in a, um, if you pass in a reference as opposed to a pointer to it, now you're going to get an exception thrown if the type you requested happens to be the wrong type. It doesn't actually have that one on the inside. So that's how that works. Um, there's another way to do it, and that's with a visitor. So what you do is you make a struct, and you define a uh, call operator for it, and you overload it. One overload per type, per alternative type, which is in your variant. So in this case, we have two here. We have uh, one which takes in a string, the other one which takes in an int, and you have the special using result type equals void because these operators here can return something, uh, so it needs to be figured that out. Um, and then you call boost apply visitor, you pass in an instance to your visitor and the variant, and it, it does the right thing. It switch selects it for you. So would you use get or visitor? So the benefits of visitor is that you get a compile time guarantee that all of your cases are handled, which is really, really nice. Um, because if you happen to miss one and you don't have an overload for something, you'll just get a compile error. Um, the benefits of using get are the code is right next to the usage, right? You can have it in the function. You don't have to make this separate struct somewhere else this far away. And you get this really nice, succinct syntax. Um, my recommendation is to always use the visitor, just because it gives you a lot more confidence when you have to refactor your code if you, if you always use visitor. For example, if you add another um, alternative to your variant type, let's say you add a new command or something like that, you'll get a compile error in every single place where um, that wasn't handled properly. Whereas if you're using get, runtime errors. So we got 12 years of experience with Variant um, since it came out. What, what kind of stuff did we learn? So the examples that I gave, this using whatever equals some kind of variant, these are problematic. Type defs in general are problematic, but this in particular. Um, we don't have a forward declaration of a of a type def. So if you have headers and you want to just say, I'm going to use this variant type or whatever, you have to include the other he the header that defines the variant. You can't just forward declare it and then get your improved compilation speeds. So that's really annoying. Uh, the error messages are completely unreadable because everything's going to refer to this variant template of all this kind of stuff, where I really want the error message to mention command. Um, and if we really, if we have a unique type that corresponds to the data structure we're trying to define that really matches the, our intended semantics. Right? We want to have it a command be a thing. It's not just a variant of these things. No, it's a command. So we'd like to have to be able to define a name for our variant that's like a real name. So one way to do this is to use inheritance. And this works okay. Um, so you make your struct. Uh, give it a name, so in this case commands, you inherit from variant, and then you define your three constructors um, with some boilerplate code and you just pass on the different constructors to the variant constructor underneath. This works, 
Um, you can do your forward declarations, you get better error messages, but there's a lot of boilerplate involved, um, especially when working with older compilers. This boilerplate I showed here works with newer compilers. Um, another way to do it is to wrap it. So I just make a struct, a struct, in this, this case called command, and I just have a single member, which is the variant on the inside. Um, this is a lot simpler, but users need to unwrap it by using the value field. So if I happen to take in a command as an argument and I need to do some kind of get on the variant on the inside, I have to call dot value. Okay, not that big of a deal, but it's something. Um, so back to that example, the recursive example. How do we make a variant for this? Well, you can't, if you're using the type def thing, you can't refer to the type def that you're assigning to or that you're defining on the right-hand side of the type def. So just using direct recursion isn't gonna work. Um, what boost variant did is they provided this special make recursive variant uh, function. So what you do is you define your alternatives with a template argument, which refers to the overall variant that you're defining. You call that magic um, make recursive variant template and uh, when you refer to your recursive alternatives on the inside, you have this boost recursive variant thing that you just call it. So you get a really tight syntax when you do this. Um, there are hidden allocations on the inside when you do a recursive variant, which makes sense, right? If you're defining a tree, there's no way you're gonna be able to make a tree without some kind of allocation there. Um, so it hides all that for you. Um, the other alternative to this is doing a direct recursion. In this case, um, we're making our binary tree, our template argument is the leaf data, so I forward declare the binary tree, which is going to be our thing which we define overall, and uh, we define our branch here, and here we have a shared pointer to the binary tree of leaf data, which, which is why we needed to have this forward declared. And then I just do that similar pattern which you saw before on the other slide um, when I want to get a new type out of the thing. So this works pretty well. We got complete control over allocation in this case. See, we got to decide that we wanted to use a shared pointer or you can use whatever kind of pointer you want. Uh, the boost uh, thing doesn't give you any power over that. Um, we can do our forward dec declarations to boot and it's more straightforward to understand. So, if you're going to do a recursive variant, this is the technique that I would recommend to use. And it's really not that much longer than the make recursive variant thing. So, the assignment problem. If you have a variant of A and B, and you initialize it to an, a value of type A, what happens when you assign it to B? So, conceptually, the variance A is destructed, we have an index and set it to B because every variant needs to keep track of which kind of thing it's referring to so the index is updated. And then the B is now initialized to the right hand side value. Um, this can be problematic if when I try to take that B and initialize it from the right hand side value, I get an exception thrown. Okay, now I'm in trouble because I can't go back to the A that I just had before because uh, I destroyed it right, because I'm using one space uh, piece there. I can't initialize a B or an A because that might also throw an exception. So what the heck do I do? So boost variant made a decision on this and I'm not gonna go into detail to how it works, but essentially what they do is they allocate on the heap extra space every time you do an assignment and they move the current contents up there in the heap um, then you initialize the B and if that throws, then I still have the old thing and I can put it back in there. So <laughs> this can be problematic and we'll talk about that later. Um, so the way that people work around this, because people hate allocations, especially when we're talking low level stuff like a variant, um, you can ensure that all the types are no throw copy constructible, right? Because then you just know that it's not gonna throw on copy so you don't have to ever do the, um, the heap allocation. You can ensure that one type is no throw default constructible. If you happen to have an int in there, then you just say, okay, well, if this special thing happens, then I'm just gonna initialize the int to zero. I know that's not gonna throw an exception. So that way you can work around the issue. Or you can always use this uh, type called boost blank as the first alternative for the variant type. 
That's essentially like an empty state. So that's boost variant. Now let's talk about std variant. So Axel Newman is the one who's been working on this. Uh, uh, that's the paper number if you want to look it up. And there are two uh, fully conformant implementations that are available. Um, I use Anthony Williams' one, and uh, he's run at this conference, so if he's there, if you see him, thank him for that, because it's awesome. So you just take this variant header from his uh, GitHub site, and you just plop it into your project, maybe change the namespace and start using it. it works awesome. So, so what's the difference? What, what did they do over boost variant? So number one, they, the apply visitor function was renamed to visit. Okay, and there's one little subtlety here. Note that you don't need to do that special type def in our output visitor thing anymore because we can figure out the right return value these days. So that's nice, it's a little bit shorter. It'll make the code a little bit cleaner maybe. Cool. Um, the second change is that get was reworked. So you know how if you took get and you passed it a pointer, it would do one thing, and if you passed it a reference, it would do another thing? Well, they decided to split that into two different functions. So you have get if and get. So if you want to see um, if, it, if it might have a string in this case, then you use get underscore if, and it will return a pointer, and you can query whether or not it's null. <coughs> Change three. Uh, is you can use get using an index now. So instead of having to specify the type in get, you can specify, oh, the zeroth alternative, or the first alternative, or the second alternative. This isn't something you would normally want to use in, in code, but if you're doing generic programming, it can be quite useful. Um, and along those same lines, uh, this fourth change is you can have duplicated entries in a variant, uh, which can kind of be confusing. You pretty much got to use the index-based access when, you, when this comes up. And you normally wouldn't want to do this in user code, but again, if you're doing some kind of um, generic programming, it's nice to be able to have a variant which can handle multiple, had, handle repeats of the same type. Um, there's no more special recursion support as there was in Boost, but that's okay because we didn't like the special recursion support that Boost had anyway. So just do uh, what I was suggesting earlier when you need to have a recursive variant. Change six, we're not calling it boost blank anymore. We're calling it std monostate. Okay, so this is a cosmetic thing. Uh, std monostate can be used in other ways besides just invariant. It's just basically a type which has exactly one value, um, has less than and all these operators defined for it which do the thing that you would expect it to. Um, so you have that. So the allocation and assignment, that was removed. So just to give you some background on this, std variant was a very contentious thing on the standardization committee. There were literally over 1,000 emails uh, spent discussing the design of this thing. And most of them were on change seven. Everybody wanted this allocation and assignment to go away. Everybody. But not everybody wanted it to go away in the same way. So that is where uh, <laughs> there were some big discussions. So there were two main camps. One is to have an explicit empty. These people said that you know, if there's an exception thrown on assignment, the variant goes into some empty state. So any variant with all alternatives, you have this empty state. You can make it empty. You can make it not empty or whatever. Pros about this. Predictable space usage, right? There's not any kind of double buffering or anything that got going on. It always goes, goes to the empty state if it needs to. Um, and it's teachable in that it's easy to explain. A variant can be empty. The cons here is that this is error prone. Error prone. So imagine you're, um, you have your tree structure. And every single node in that could be empty. So how many different empty states does your tree have? Like a whole ton of all different kinds of empty states. That's really not what the programmer intended. So that's, you really want it to not be empty for that kind of a case. Um, and the semantics become complex as a result. So every single function that you write which takes in one of your variants, you have to have a precondition which says the thing isn't empty. Um, those were the drawbacks with this alternative. The second alternative, this is the uh, alternative that I was pushing for, but nobody on the committee ever gets what they really want. So this one has the never empty guarantee, and you just 
make it double buffered if it has to be double buffered. Uh, if it's a friendly type, you know, if all the alternatives happen to be no throw assign or no throw constructible, all that kind of stuff, then you don't double buffer. So only double buff buffer exactly when you have to. Um, you get these really simple semantics. Uh, never empty is what most people need. Uh, the cons here is that it's difficult to predict and control your space requirements because what defines a friendly type, I put that in quotes friendly because it's so hard to explain. So it, it's just really hard to look at a variant like this and decide, oh, is this using double buffering or not? Um, and you're paying a high price. How often does an exception get thrown on assignment? Like hardly ever. And when it does get thrown, it's usually because you're out of memory, in which case you're gonna just blow up your program anyway. There's, you don't really recover from that. There may be three people in the universe who care about that scenario. So what we've got is a compromise, which is a variant which is rarely empty. <laughs> so the empty state is called valueless by exception. That long name was specifically engineered to scare you away from it. <laughs> Don't think about it. <laughs> if an exception is thrown on assignment, you put the variant into the valueless by exception state. Um, and friendly types cannot get into the valueless by exception state. It's just impossible for friendly types. But the pros here is you get the predictable space usage. It's not double buffering. It's teachable. Um, there are simple semantics in normal, normal usage. If you're doing abnormal things, first stop. Like, you shouldn't be doing that. Second, okay, we're giving you this flag so that you can do your abnormal things. And the biggest cons uh, pro about this approach is that we got consensus. And variant is in the standard, in my opinion, many, many, many years late. So the cons here is that in the exceptional case, when your assignment does throw, you have to make sure that you think about your variant being in this valueless by exception state. Um, so when, do you, when does this actually come up? So it turns out you don't really need to know if it's in valueless by exception state because you already had an exception thrown which said something along the lines of variant had an exception being thrown. Um, so you don't even really need something to query it. If you're querying it, you're trying to reconstruct your data type uh, that's been corrupted in, in a certain way, um, which you shouldn't be doing. So in the end, you don't really ever have to deal with valueless by exception variants in normal code. If you write a function, you don't need to write a precondition that it, you know what the special usages for valueless by exception, just all of them are not in this state. Um, and they only get into this state in your exception handling code. So that was the decision there. Um, and to sum it up, std variant, these are mostly incremental improvements over boost variants. Um, nothing really spectacular out there. The handling of exceptions on assignment was the big change uh, from boost variant. And this is in the C17 working paper coming to a compiler near you. So before I go on, uh, let me just take a quick, like maybe two questions. If you have any questions on this, come on, talk about something else real quick. Question. Uh, when you had that recursion variant, did you use shared pointer? Mm -hmm. Did you have to use shared pointer because of the, the, the incomplete type? Um, the question was, did I have to use shared pointer in the example usage with the recursive variant because it had an incomplete type? And the answer is yes. Uh, what happens if you don't use exceptions? What happens if you don't use exceptions? I don't know. If you don't use exceptions and nothing ever throws an exception, then you never go into the valueless by exception state. It's a non-issue. What happens when you visit a, uh, a variant that is in this valueless by exception state? If you visit a variant in the valueless exception state, valueless by exception state, first off, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Second off, you're going to get an exception. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on. So, language support for variant. This is, this is my pet uh, project here. Um, I think that variants come up often enough in code 
that having le language level support for them uh, would be very beneficial. And I'll explain why. So first let's just look at what it looks like. So it looks a lot like a struct. So in this case we have a variant that is used for a JSON object. I assume you're all familiar with those. Um, and each field works exactly like a struct, except instead of putting and in between all those lines, we're putting or in between all those lines. So the command either has a set score size t, or it has a fire missile monostate, or a fire laser, or a rotate. If you want to create a value of this command type, you just uh, call the field after colon colon. Now all this syntax is you know, subject to change. It's just very early design stage. Uh, the committee's only seen this a couple times so far. Um, we have basic pattern matching. So instead of having to put your struct some crazy place, you can put it right there in line uh, with an inspect statement. So in this case, we have a command. You inspect it. Um, if it sets score, then you bind value to that size t, output it. Um, if it's fire missile, you do something, and, and so on and so forth. Pretty straightforward. Um, one thing that came up is, you know, why do we need a language-based variant? Is, is a li library solution sufficient? Let's see. So here we have a variant, uh, exactly like what we were doing with the uh, L variant there. So we have two visit options. We have type-based. Uh, we can get you know, which alternative based on the type, or we can do it based on the index. So index-based visit is kind of nasty, right? Because you've got to remember the names of the indices. So maybe you're going to want to like, make these constants to say which uh, thing in there corresponds to the index. Um, this just requires more boilerplate. It's error-prone if you, if you get your indices wrong. Um, not really too nice. Type-based visit is also kind of nasty. So if I write std get of unsigned, what happens? Because size t could be a type def to unsigned. Will it compile? Um, does it give me the set score alternative? Is it platform dependent? All the answers are bad, right? This is no good. So what people do to work around this problem is they make these special tag structs so you have the different types in there. So you have a struct for your set score, a struct for your fire missile, and so on and so forth. Um, this requires more boilerplate. Um, and it introduces these types which really don't make sense in isolation. Um, they really only make sense in, when they're all put together. So that's not too nice either. So another way to think about it is um, the struct-tuple connection. Because we have std tuple and we have struct. Uh, here's a point type uh, with the x, y, and z field. And using point equals std tuple double double double. So these are two different ways to make a point class. You can make it with a struct, you can make it with a tuple. Uh, the tuple version has all the same problems as the indexed variant, though. You know, do you get by you get by index? Which index corresponds to x, y, and z? Maybe you can remember, maybe you can't for a more complex case. Um, so then use type-based dispatch and make these special struct x, y, and z, and then you have using point equals a tuple of that. So then you have this strange field x, like what are you gonna do with that? That's, does it have any meaning in isolation? I don't think so. Now would anybody recommend doing this with a tuple instead of just using a struct? No, I don't think so. Um, so that's not saying that tuples don't have their use, um, but I'm saying that structs have a use and tuples have a use. It's nice to have them both. L variants relate very closely to structs. So you have an L variant and you have the corresponding uh, stud variant of it. And uh, this is a copoint. This is like a mathematical thing which says, you know, a certain amount of direction along X or Y or Z. Um, you get the exact same problems. So same reasoning, what's an X? Um, would anybody recommend using this instead of an L variant? I don't think so. So, stud variants have their use, but uh, so do L variants, and um, we're working on bringing these kinds of things into the language. 
Um, so just a sampling of the std variant problems. If you use them a lot, uh, you get unhelpful error messages a lot of times because this is template programming. Um, the code for visitation is kind of ugly, um, and there are portability issues. So like if you have this database handle thing there, is this code future proof? Not likely, because what if Oracle handle and Berkeley handle end up having the same underlying type at some point in the future? That'd be bad. So variants are simple and a common need, uh, but a library only solution is too complex. But if that's all you got, use it. It's gonna make your code a lot better. So our proposal is to make the basic language-based variant. Uh, pattern matching is closely tied to L variants. So uh, if you have an L variant here, you do your pattern matching. Um, and you'll note that in the second one here, uh, set position, I'm doing a pattern on the thing on the inside. So if the position is like a pair of doubles, then I can go ahead and match on the doubles and say that, that matches those and so on and so forth. So the idea with the pattern matching proposals is that I can match on integrals and enums. So if I have an int, I can do pattern matching on that. I can do it on structs. So a struct here, um, I'm inspecting this one which has a name, hit points, and coins. In my inspection statement, I'm binding n to the name, h to the hit points, c to the coins, um, which is kind of ugly. So we should really be able to match on the fields. And, and we do propose to do that. So that way the code gets a little bit more clear. However, we don't wanna just have pattern matching on structs and L variants. Because what if I have my own custom type which has private data and I wanna provide a way for my consumers to match on that thing? So the idea is to also provide an opt-in. If you have your special type, like in this case, a, uh, a pair where the first and second members are private, I should be able to make an operator extract that provides the compiler this information to say that when someone matches on this, this is how I want it to behave. I'm not gonna go into more detail than that because uh, it's still ongoing work uh, in terms of pattern matching and what we're gonna do with that, but this kind of gives you a hint in terms of the direction that we're trying to head into. So, let's see, how much more time do we have? 20 minutes, okay. Good thing I brought some extra slides. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of other proposals that are out there related to variants that I think are interesting. So this one uh, by Vincente, the idea is to make a function called std overload. What this will do is it will take a bunch of lambda functions, which each have a different kind of argument, and combine them into one function object, which acts like the kind of thing that you would use the std visit on. What this buys you is instead of having to make this struct in some other area of the code, you can do your visit in line like this. So this is not in C17, didn't make it in time, but the library is available. This is something that you can use and play around with. And it makes the code a little bit nicer to work with. And uh, second bonus slide, visitors with extra arguments. So a lot of times you need to do a visitor, uh, but you, you wanna have other data available to you when you're uh, going through your different alternative types. You wanna have like extra parameters that apply to all the different uh, alternative cases. So there's a, a nifty way that you can do that. The first thing you do is, uh, so this is just a design pattern. You, you forward declare your function, in this case put, and in your, um, your struct, which is your visitor here, are you guys seeing me scroll down? Is that working? Keys don't work. There. Okay, so you forward declare your thing, um, your, your visitor, and then each of your operations, you add the extra argument that you care about. In this case, the O stream is the thing that we're, we wanna make sure is there in our case statement. And then finally, 
when you implement your function, you can use std binds to take your visitor, bind this to the second argument of it, or the first argument of it in this case, and use that with your visit function. So it comes up every now and then. It's a good thing to know. So um, this, this is a, a very contentious subject on variant. So I'm sure lots of you guys have questions, comments, and uh, insults. So let's, let's, let's get that, let's do that right now. So the question is, are you going to be able to define like member functions into an L variant? Or so like a default constructor that um, specific or, or a default constructor. So this is all stuff that's being investigated right now. So probably yes. So the question is, how would the compiler underneath do this kind of pattern matching? Um, and the model that I have in my mind is you can take that pattern matching code and break it up into switch statements, uh, in nested switch statements. Um, so if that helps understand it, but I'm sure the compiler does more crazy things than that. So this is a comment. Um, going through the slides on the compiler support for L-variant, I saw a lot of stuff going on there. I saw some of the weird new operators, equal, greater than, colon, brace list. That, that seems like a huge amount of changing the language for just this variant feature. So the comment was that this seems like a huge change in the language for just this variant feature. Okay. What are the performance considerations for applying the visit, especially as compared to the other ways of being able to estimate? Uh, so the question is, what are the performance implications of uh, using visit compared to other ways of doing this? And uh, the answer is, uh, when you look at the code which is generated based on using visit, it's basically inlining all that stuff. So what you get is the optimal code at the end. It's wicked fast. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, you're implying that there is no visit that takes a uh, integer argument. Like this is ambiguous which visitor you want based on the integer argument. So I guess that's where I think the portability is important. So the comment was that in the database example, um, I'm assuming that the visitor is not visiting based on index. And the question is, is there a way to make one? As far as I know, um, there isn't a way to do that just yet, to do a, a visit based on index only. Uh, is there a way to, to use m place as opposed to copying? Yes, you can, you can do that. Uh, the question is, um, will you have to, uh, will it be smart enough to realize that my variance in, e my L variance in enum? And uh, that's like way future, like I have no idea. My, my guess is yes. Ah, the comment was that maybe you can use constex for if to, to do something like this. He believes that we can. So I will 
I'm encouraged. So the comment was that it looks strikingly like structured bindings. Shouldn't we like share some kind of syntax? And the answer is, yeah, definitely. So um, we want to make sure that they're the same at the end of the day. So if L variant were accepted, would the library based variant go away? So the question is, if L variant were accepted, would the library based variant go away? And the answer is no. Just like having struct doesn't mean that you don't need a tuple anymore. Um, are there any plans to have the pattern matching be exhausted and then some plans that not? So the question is, are there any plans to have the pattern matching be exhaustive and to have it complain if it's not? Um, that hasn't really been investigated too much yet, um, but if it's not exhaustive and you use it in an expression, then that's a big problem. That's like undefined behavior or throw an exception or something. I don't know. Will pan pattern matching work with std any? There are some folks who would like it to work with std any. I'm not sure if I'm one of them or, or not yet. Um, the, but the committee has definitely said they want to be able to switch on a base class, match on a base class, and have different cases for the different derived classes. Personally, I find that to be an abomination. But if we need to do that to get it in, then, you know, compromise. So the question is, are there anything used inside of, uh, uh, I, pr pr I assume you're talking about these implementations of, of std variant that we have available, um, or in the interface itself that require you know, special compilers or newer language support. And the answer is no, you, you can implement a version of std variant with C++ 11 stuff. Uh, or you can implement it without like the special move semantic stuff with C++ 98. There's nothing really special that it needs. In terms of those impl implementations of what they use, I'm not really sure. I think they need at least C++11 because I know they use variadics. Uh, questions are, what are the, le the minimal changes required to implement L variant? Oh, plain variant. Uh, I don't think that we need any changes to implement std variant. So std variant could have conceptually, I mean, it's going into C++ 17, right? But it could have conceptually gone into C++ 11. There's nothing, uh, it doesn't require any special new features to implement, um, although the new features are convenient when you want to implement it. So are we talking about L variant? Like right. just std variant? Yeah. yeah, I don't think we need any language special sugar or anything to use it. It's, it's available, you can use it now, and I would recommend it. So the question is, what do I see as the biggest obstacle of getting this kind of open pattern matching into the language? Um, you know, it all kind of boils down to getting consensus. Uh, like the way the committee works, you have to have like 80% of the people agree that this is the way to go forward. And you know, if you have just 30% of the people who say, I don't like it, I'd rather just not have it, then it's very difficult to, to move past that. So. Um, it's really coming up with a, a compelling argument which everybody agrees with, or at least 80%. Questions? Um, 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, did anybody understand that? <laughs> Maybe can I... nested pattern matching? Yes. Oh, um, yes. So nested pattern matching is definitely part of the plan to be able to have nested patterns in there. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does the language-based matching stuff handle multiple visitation things? And the idea is, is that in your match call, instead of just putting one thing in the parentheses, you can put multiple things with commas, and then you know match based on that. So just the exact same way that stood visit works. The question is, are new keywords required for the language-based variant stuff? Uh, maybe. So I started out with a proposal calling it an enum union, like an enumerated union. And that was not very well liked. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see what we come up with. Uh, there, there might be a new keyword or two. Uh, I'm <laughs> Re comment is register is available now. <laughs> there you go. We'll call them registers. <laughs> Any other questions? When you define a firing type, do you have a choice uh, on the ordering of the types by the field? So often the choice is not really relevant. So do you think it can help for the type system trying to handle any permutation of the field and treat them as the same situation? Okay, so the comment was, uh, right now the ordering matters. Uh, what if we made the ordering not matter and you know a, a variant int comma string is the same thing as a variant string comma int? So this is something that we discussed on the committee. Um, and it turns out there are a lot of problems when you're trying to do template logic for that because we don't really have an ordering of types so we can't come up with a unique uh, sequence given any kind of type that we can compare against another sequence. So the implementation of that's really hard. Um, but also along those lines, uh, there was a desire to model a discriminated union where you really, the ordering does matter with a discriminated union. And what you're talking about is modeling a union. So uh, we just decided in the committee that we're gonna go for modeling discriminated union. and that's. That affected all the rest of the pieces of the interface. The question is, am I proposing underscores a match all, or is that just a regular variable name? Um, so, like the exact concrete syntax isn't really been something that I've been proposing yet. Um, maybe question mark would work better there. Uh, there are some comments that underscore is used in other libraries, so there would be a conflict. Um, so we'll, we'll figure out something that works um, with existing code and doesn't break, break anything. That's the goal anyway. Have I considered what uh, an implementation of optional would look like with a L variant. Uh, yeah, so it would be, the, it would have two fields. One would be of type std monostate, and the other one would be of the, the thing that you wanna, the value of the optional type. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you guys.